Good morning and welcome to another season of Are You Up Bad? I was out of school, I finished studying and then I went to work for a big banking institution and I want to tell you about my manager. His name was Mr. Hayden Ruch and he was an amazing manager. He was an extremely knowledgeable man and he was excellent at what he did. He had a presence about him that naturally exuberated authority. Wherever he walked, he was a quiet man and when he walked, people around him knew he was there. He just had this incredible presence about him. However, when he was with people, you would hear him laughing. He was just an incredible man. He was not arrogant in any way. I can remember what I loved most was when he walked past my desk, he would always stop to tell me an interesting story or share something with me. And he often shared funny stories. My favorite was when he would call us into his office. We would sit opposite him, opposite his desk with a duplicate document that he would be checking for a trustees meeting. Either he would read and we would follow and check or we would read and he would follow and check. It was always a very pleasant time. Just watching him lead and interact was a learning and a teaching of what a leader looked like. He was also a Christian man and would share his faith in the workplace. I didn't just work for him, but I had meaningful fellowship with him during this time. That really struck me as we look at our relationship with God, and I'm speaking specifically as a Christian. We can get so stuck in the work that we do for God that we forget to have fellowship with God. Now maybe as I say that you're thinking what exactly does that mean? Well John 3:16, I think the most famous verse most people know this verse off by heart and it says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now God had given us laws to obey but God went so much further than what we need to do or the work. He was so desperate. He loves us so much. He wanted to fellowship with us so much. He bridged the gap through Jesus Christ, his son. He made a way that we can get into his presence and experience his love. It was even more than what we can do for him. It was just being with him. So God did something because he wanted to have fellowship with us. And if you read 2 Peter 3 verse 9, it says that God loves us so much. His plan would be that none should perish, but that all should be saved. And that's exactly what John 3.16 says, that none should perish, all should be saved, because God so loved the world that he sent his begotten son for that reason. And when we get to know him, we get to be in his presence, we get to bask in that presence, we actually want to obey. Just like working with that manager that I loved so dearly, that I enjoyed his presence so much, I worked hard because of the relationship, the fellowship that I had with him. I wanted to go beyond the extra mile. I worked hard to please him and to do the work that was necessary. And that's exactly how it is with God. When we know him, when we spend time in his presence, we don't have to obey him. We want to obey him. And then what happens is instead of us having a list of laws or a list of rules or a list of do's or don'ts, we actually want to obey. It's no longer his will versus our will, his way versus our way. It's that we love him so much, that we know him, that we want to do his will. When we don't know God and we have these lists of laws or rules or requirements that we have to meet but now 
it's not always what we want to do because we have our own will, our own way. We end up failing. And when we fail, we experience condemnation because we know what we should have done. Now remember, God doesn't condemn, the devil condemns us. When we feel condemned, we have an identity crisis or we have an identity issue. And this is really not what God wants. God wants us to understand that when we know him, we are able, because we love him, we are able to resist temptation. We don't do that in our strength. He strengthens us. When we are able to resist temptation, we don't feel condemned. We don't feel bad. And because we don't feel bad, we don't suffer from an identity crisis. We know who we are in God. And so when you know this incredible presence of God, when you have fellowship with him, other voices become dim. His word renews our mind. Spending time in his presence and reading the word of God renews our mind. And when our minds are renewed, we are not deceived to make the wrong decisions. We actually make the right decisions because we renewed our mind. We have direction for that day. You see, an uncharged mind is like an uncharged cell phone. You can't use an uncharged cell phone. An uncharged cell phone is not going to help us in any way. It's exactly the same with a mind that has been uncharged or hasn't been renewed in the Word of God that day. We do not know the right way to go because our mind hasn't been recharged in the Word of God. I want to share with you an incredibly, incredibly encouraging story from the Bible about a boy who was about the age of 15, a shepherd boy who was anointed king. The king of the time had turned his heart away from God. His name was Saul. He turned his heart away from God. And so God sent his prophet to this shepherd boy, David, to anoint him to be king. He would become the new king. He wasn't king yet. He would become the new king. For the first two years about of his life, he actually went to stay in the palace. He killed the giant Goliath. He went to stay in the palace and actually he was a musician. So he played the harp, which soothed King Saul, who was an evil king. And then the king really stabbed him in the back. He tried to kill him. He put his men against him. He tried to deceive him by offering his daughter's hand in marriage. Everything the king did was actually to destroy this shepherd boy who was anointed to become the king. And his plan was to kill him. He literally threw his spear to try and kill him. And eventually, after the two years, this shepherd boy realized he needed to run away. His life was no longer safe or protected by the king. He literally lived in caves and had to be in hiding and eventually he went to live in a town outside of Israel called Ziglag. He was married now and had children. His men, he had 600 faithful men who followed him, who were warriors with him, who went to live outside Israel with him and who hid away from the king with him. And they lived in this village or this town called Ziglag. They had wives, they had children. And the one day they went away, the men went, and when they came back, they realized the village had been burned down. Now I want you to think, because we all experience difficult times, no matter what they've been. He came home and his village and his home, his community had been burned down. Their wives and their children had been kidnapped. They didn't know if they were alive or dead. All their belongings, all their things had been taken. His men lay on the floor and wept in grief because they'd lost their wives and their children, their homes, their village, the community and all their things. They grieved. And when they had nothing more in them, they had grieved completely. They stood up. And they wanted to kill David. Can you imagine? David had lost exactly what they had lost. But can you imagine how alone he felt? He was cast out of Israel. 
He was in hiding, he'd lost everything, and now his men, who had his back, were about to stab him in his back, literally. And he went to the Lord in this incredible time of loneliness, and he wrote Psalm 138, verse 7, and it says this, Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will preserve me against the anger of my enemies. Your power will save me. The Lord will work out his plan for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. You can hear from this passage that David understood the presence, the love of God. He basked in the presence. He knew God. It wasn't a relationship where he had to do for God. It was a relationship where he loved God. He knew God loved him and he knew God knew the plans for his life. God had told him he was going to be king. He didn't think he deserved to be king, but he trusted what God had said. And this was David's darkest moment in his life. And then he writes Psalm 139 verse 3, which says, You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. In other words, to God, he is never forgotten and he is never lost. Every moment you know where I am. This was David's darkest moment. What David did not know was that in exactly a week from this darkest moment, his enemy Saul would be killed and he would be seated on the throne. This was about 15 years later. I want you to imagine that. 15 years after being anointed as king, two years staying in the palace, and then 13 years about of running away from King Saul. A week now to go, and he doesn't know in one week's time, Saul is going to be killed, and he is going to be on the throne as king. But you see, it seems that just before our greatest victories, the devil sends his biggest attacks against our life. But David trusted the Lord and he stood firm. I really want to encourage you because maybe you've been waiting a long time and you're still single and you were hoping to be married. You're still poor and you were hoping to have provision for you and your family. You're still jobless and you were hoping to have a job. Your business is still struggling and you were hoping for it to be off the ground and profitable. You're still struggling with a child that is lost or you're still battling with a difficult marriage and you were hoping for breakthrough. I want to encourage you that when the devil seems to send his biggest attack, your victory is just around the corner. Stand firm, don't give up, and remember that God knows exactly where you are. The Bible says every moment you know where I am. God knows exactly where you are, and you are not forgotten. I want to encourage you, you are not forgotten. When your heart and your mind seems to be in the most excruciating pain, I just want to encourage you to get into the presence of God. If you say, I don't even know what to say to God, then I want to say to you this. Simply be still and know that He is God. I want to say that again. Then simply be still and know that he is God. I hope the word encourages you today. It certainly encouraged me. What an amazing man David was simply because he trusted God. His life was not problem free, but he trusted God no matter what was going on around him. If I can encourage you today, trust God no matter what is going on around you. Come, let's pray together. Father, 
Help us to trust you no matter what is going on around us. We want to say sorry, Lord, for the times when we haven't trusted you, when we have thought that you have forgotten us, or when we thought we need to make our own plans. Father, forgive us for when we have stopped trusting you, when we have blamed you or been angry at you for what's going on around us. I pray, Lord, we would remember when the devil sends us temptations, to turn us away from you. You step alongside us and you say, this is a test and my child will pass it. I pray, Father God, we will understand that you don't allow the enemy to overtake us. You always make a way for us to overcome. I pray, Lord, again, we would realize this is our greatest victory and we will overcome because of the blood of the Lamb. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. As I close, I want to encourage you, don't believe the lies of the devil when he comes with a temptation. The Bible says God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. Instead, God steps next to you and goes, hey, let's turn this temptation from the devil into a test. My child, you're going to pass this test and it's going to be a promotion. You are not only going to overcome, you're going to have victory today. So be encouraged, be still, and know that He is God. He knows exactly where you are. May God bless you.